Okay, uh, so before we start our presentation, uh, please do us a favor. Wake up from the food coma. Come on, wake up. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, thank you. Mm. So uh, who are we? Uh, we are all from Stark and Wayne. Uh, Wayne will introduce who are Stark we. Stark and Wayne is essentially a consultancy. We help you be superheroes, or we help you and your company be superheroes succeeding with your Cloud Foundry or PaaS story, essentially. We help with everything from infrastructure operations to any kinds of automation, building uh, back-end services and applications, 12-factor uh, applications, we help you figure that out. Basically everything all up and down along the stack, that's what we do. We fill in any gaps that you may have in the uh, services and PaaS, and we basically integrate all the different pieces. We don't just do that for you, though. We also teach you how to do it yourselves. And uh, ba so the approach we use, we partner with you guys, and we uh, work alongside you so that you gain the skills as well. And uh, basically, we greatly increase your speed of adoption of the uh, Cloud Foundry Paz like uh, ecosystem. Uh, put another way, we help you be productive pretty much from the first week. Okay, so you may wonder, then who created this wonderful company? It's this guy, uh, Dr. Nick William, Williams. Yeah. Uh, Try to yeah. hide in the background there, he's a little spooky like that. But. Yeah. Good guy, if you ever meet him, come up and say hi, he'll, he'll talk. Good, but. Uh, next. Who is Xu Zhao? Xu Zhao is a cloud engineer at Stark and Wayne, and uh, she's been working with us on our GE project, which we'll be mentioning uh, who is Wayne? Wayne is the CTO of Stark and Wayne, so uh, he is my boss. Uh, also, he named Kai Xin Guo in Chinese means happiness, like always make people laugh. I guess some of you already see that. <laughs> uh, next is. I highly encourage all of you to visit our blog. We post uh, technology things for any technology we're exploring, not just Cloud Foundry and Pad, but also PostgreSQL and many other things, uh, Vagrant, VirtualBox, uh, any different kinds of scripting and automation, various languages, whatever happens to be on our mind or a challenge that we're uh, dealing at the some particular point in time, we post it there. All the comments and discussions are always welcome also. <laughs> yeah, uh, so that's about us. Uh, next, we will go to our talk. So we don't have an outline here. Uh, the reason is because we are going to uh, ha tell you a story by having a conversation like how this project happened and what's the current state, what's the future. So, future. yeah, so long, long time ago, a princess lived in, a, okay, I'm joking, you should cut her she laugh here. Uh, <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah. Uh, so seriously, what is this project? All right. For first, let me give you some context. Um, yesterday, was it yesterday? Gosh, I don't even know anymore. Yeah, the first uh, of the our end. first oh, keynote yeah. speaker of the conference, Parag uh, from GE, he described the Predix platform in great uh, overview. Well, GE built this uh, industrial internet or IoT platform called Predix based around this thing called Cloud Foundry, which is a platform as a service or a PaaS. This project that we're going to be giving this talk on is the system providing the PostgreSQL to that Predix platform that was displayed as a Postgres tile in his slides uh, during that keynote presentation. Uh, yeah, uh, so if you attend the keynote, probably you will have a bad idea of what he is saying. Uh, but this is uh, what is this project, but uh, why we need this project. So uh, you will share more details? Sure. Huh? So in the beginning, there was Postgres. Oh. Oh, yeah. uh, anyways, and then a long time later came around this uh, thing called Cloud Foundry. Cloud Foundry is basically an enterprise grade platform as a service for running applications like Heroku style, if you're familiar with that, or Docker style, if you're familiar with that. Um, so basically it's build packs or Docker. And a lot of excitement ensued once people actually figured out what the heck it was and what it did for them. It was power, flexibility, and business velocity it enabled. Uh, thing is, Cloud Foundry as a PaaS, well, they, they kind of punt on stateful services, which are databases. 
stuff like that. Um, so PostgreSQL falls directly into that category. So that's kind of like why we needed this project uh, because CF doesn't provide that. Yeah. Uh, then, uh, how did it get started? Like, why did you find us to work on this? So we had already been for several months helping GE be very successful with uh, building and deploying and automating everything around the Predix platform, Cloud Foundry based. And after a few several months, uh, we met with them and they asked if they could, if we could help them provide a PostgreSQL service to the Cloud Foundry based Predix platform. And of course, you know, as usual, absolutely, that's exactly what we do. Mm -hmm. Yes, on it. <laughs> so, following that conversation was the immediately next obvious conversation. Let's gather some requirements. Let's see what you guys need. Keep in mind that at this point in time, uh, Predix platform itself uh, was under construction, had no users, Therefore, really no use cases could easily be flushed out. So our initial requirements were essentially from the uh, complete viewpoint of GE's cloud services or, or uh, team that was building out the platform. Yeah, so next I, I will pretend I'm the GE side. Uh, I will help him what we require. Who are your users? <laughs> So at first, we want to use this uh, inside our business, like uh, other business unit. Uh, for example, uh, the industry internet uh, application group. Uh, then later on, hopefully we can provide this service to the external Predix customers. Hmm. All right, well, what kind of workloads are these users gonna run? All kinds of workloads. If you want an example, uh, OLAP and OLTP. Oh. Yeah. Yes. Okay. How many databases do we need to account for on this thing? <laughs> That's a good question. You know, we don't have the real user yet, so we have no idea at this time. Okay, well, what can you tell us that you actually view as requirements then? Uh, I can tell you two things. First, I want it to be HA as HA as humanly possible. Second, I also want it has a DR solution, like you can do backup and restore. Oh, okay. Well, yeah, that's, can that's you guys good. do that? Absolutely. <laughs> Great, we'll get started on this, let's go on. So we okay. went back and then we had some internal discussions amongst us, a lot of it in my head. And then uh, we decided to, uh, or when we had these discussions internally, we basically sat down, we reviewed the requirements that we had gathered, which were kind of thin. We uh, discussed our architecture and how we're going to distribute the thing, and the life cycle and operations management, how we're going to go about doing those things. Yeah, so you will see there are lots of things outside of Postgres SQL in order to support it. Yeah, not just Postgres, there's yeah. a lot of machinery around this thing. So the first thing that we uh, did is, all right, well, based on what we know from the discussion, what is the requirements of this thing? Well. We know we're going to have it's connecting to Cloud Foundry for the Predix environment, so we obviously have to have a CF service broker. Mm -hmm. That is a mechanism by which uh, services like databases get connected to applications that are running in a Cloud Foundry PaaS environment. Mm -hmm. We know that it's basically going to end up having a bit of a distributed backend because of it's going to have multiple clusters in order to run these. We don't know many databases and things like that, and we're pretty sure at the time they were going to have different service types. Um, so, again, we, yeah, so when we step back and we're like, oh, well, what do they need? Well, it's going to have to have multiple clusters running, going to need the CF uh, service broker to connect the database to the applications in CF. We're going to have a, basically a semi-complex distributed system. So uh, we're going to need like a, a management cluster to mm -hmm. manage the thing. And then we're going to have many like service clusters to run the actual databases that the end users are connecting to. Potentially hundreds of thousands of applications might connect to this thing, so we're also probably going to need some connection uh, pooling, like a PG bouncer kind of thing. So oh. Also, maybe it should be easily scale out. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Scaling out, and like, so basically, great, we're at capacity for these VMs. Uh, we need more. Oh, yeah. well, we need a mechanism by which to do that. Yeah, that's a very mm. good point. Yeah, later on, we will show you like how we make the scaling up and the scaling out so easily. It actually works. 
Um, okay, great. So based on this uh, reviewing of the requirements, we kind of figured we needed these pieces. Uh, basically, the uh, ability to read re redirect and load balance the incoming connection traffic for the admin API and the PostgreSQL connections uh, and the service broker API. Uh, we basically used H we decided to use HA proxy for that layer. And then uh, based on the other requirements, the massive amount of connections, we used a PG bouncer for that. The reason we didn't, uh, at the load balancer level, use just PG bouncer, because obviously it can do that feature, uh, is because of where we're also doing the HTTPS and HTTP traffic for the a uh, APIs uh, that were being used for that. Um, the, to, and then the whole uh, ultra mega insane high availability requirement, humanly possible thing. Uh, well, at the time, we didn't really have much to go on, so we said, hey, the BDR is, uh, we know for a fact that it's being run in like tons of different production environments. This is a sub point to that, but I'll get to that later. Um, and uh, basically it has some restrictions, but if you could accept those restrictions, it basically could provide exactly what we're looking at, at for high availability. So we went with uh, Postgres with BDR for our service clusters to kind of get the high availability. So if any one node went away, we just redirected the right traffic. Uh, at the time, it was 9.4. 9.5 hadn't been released yet. Uh, yeah. To communicate amongst the components of the cluster for the back-end system that's kind of managing all this stuff, uh, the, what we found historically in the past as the best system for us to uh, write distributed systems around is console. We used to use etcd, and then uh, console just provided us with that much more, so we kind of have standardized inner company with console, so we now use console for that. If you guys don't know what console is, brief synopsis is that it's a multi-data center aware, um, key value store, <coughs> DNS uh, service, system. Service, service discovery. Yeah. Service, and service, mm -hmm. service discovery with the, mm -hmm. using the DNS. Basically, uh, it also has some failure detection capabilities mm -hmm. built in. Uh, very uh, robust uh, tool for how young it is. And then um, we prefer to write our backend service pieces in the Go language. So for our service broker and the agents and daemons that are running on all the clusters and communicating via console and APIs, we wrote that in Go. The reason we prefer Go is because all the pain is handled development side. When you go to run this thing in production, you copy the binary to start it. That's a great story for uh, operations uh, versus having to manage dependencies and install those dependencies just to be able to use tools. There's a lot of great tools out there like Wally, right? Patroni other things like that. They all fall very short on the operations side. To make operations person, I want to punch goats. Uh, <laughs> because there's all these dependencies and you can get into a dependency you now if you're not careful. Season systems and stuff like that. I can manage them. Why do that? Shouldn't manage that. Anyways, yeah. rant done. <laughs> So uh, we talk about all those components, then how we hook up together for all those pieces to uh, our project. This is a simple diagram, uh, architecture diagram for it. So uh, this part is the CF part. Uh, then on top we have this load balancer. You, you can see in the menu man uh, management, I cannot talk, Ma management cluster, we have the PG bouncer, progress SQL, uh, uh, management agent, uh, like talk with CF, use S, B API, service broker API, uh, admin API, work task uh, can talk with the service uh, cluster. In, in, in this stage, early stage, we are still using BDR, so you will see <coughs> in service cluster, each node we will have uh, uh, two nodes in one cluster, so ba basically it's uh, two nodes in a BDR group. Uh, this is the early stage. Uh, and how we are going to uh, scale up and uh, scale out is very easy. So scale up uh, means, uh, let's say, uh, you run out of disk for your database. You, you want uh, more disk, you may want more v uh, large VMs. So basically we can only change some configuration in the deployment, uh, then uh, click a button to deploy again, then you will get large VMs and lar large disk. Uh, for scale out, say, okay, um, Originally, I planned for 1,000 uh, database. Now, we, we have 2,000, 5,000. How are we going to do that? So it's very easy. You can add more VM instances. So then in that way, you can create more user database. So given this service metrics structure, uh, we can very easily scale up and out. 
uh, we are not going to show the details because that happened in a, uh, the tool we deployed, like called Bosch. Did I pronounce it? Yes, I said it early, but I mean, if you care, curious how uh, is in the later slides. Also, uh, oh. on that, that PG bounce is called PostgreSQL component on management cluster. So we internally, we run a three node management cluster. Internally, we can keep the uh, restrictions of GDR. We have no problem with it. So we can retry a lot of other factor VDL uh, locks and stuff like that, and you're good to go. So right now, even today, we're still using VDR in a management cluster. Um, still reevaluating that decision because of some things we'll get to later on in the presentation, but that is it. That's where the story. The thing about this is, it turns out if you guys just, uh, for your uh, information, you ever use BDR? Use three or more nodes. Use three or more nodes. This set us up for failure. Because it turns out BDR, for the features we were trying to use it for, needs three nodes <laughs> for one to go away and things still work. Otherwise, you end up in some. I can't find anything helpful from the guys who want to look at these things. And it's a very interesting thing to get for. Oh, so PG Bounce, then you run on the Postgres data server, or can you just. I can't hear you. Can you do run PG Bounce on the data server, or can you just. Uh, PG Bouncer is uh, run on every single service cluster node, as well as the management nodes, uh, at least in this diagram. So when people connect through, they're actually connecting to technically the project first, but they're connecting to PG Bouncer, which then connects to Postgres. And uh, what's, uh, what's the uh, most secret transition for the inside? Or? Mm -hmm. Inside is more, right? And yeah, yeah. Because PG Bouncer doesn't support some of the queries. Right. Uh, we went with the most. Yeah, so next. Ah, yes. So she kind of gave you a little sneak peek. So uh, this thing that we've been describing, all the components and the complex uh, distributed system and all the ability out, how the hell are you going to deploy that thing in a repeatable fashion? How are you going to handle upgrades, CDE responses? That's a big thing, especially since we're dealing with enterprises like GE, Intel, both that. Maintenance, how are you going to maintain this thing? And as she pointed out, scaling. The answer is here. You do those things with Bosch. Yeah, it's a word out. I cannot pronounce correctly. Or Google server. <laughs> um, but Bosch stands yeah. for Bosch Outer Shell. Oh my oh. God, did they really do that? Yes, they did, it turns out. Um, Bosch is essentially infrastructure operations orchestration platform. So basically, you have your infrastructure as a service. You may be using EC2. You may be using Google Compute Engine. You may be using Azure. You may be using OpenStack, OpenShift. <laughs> You may be using mm -hmm. OpenStack, maybe you know all these different things, maybe on-prem like use your data center or OpenStack or in cloud. Bosch supports all of those, which means that once we built this system on top of Bosch, we then could deploy the system to all of those. This avoids vendor lock-in. This allows people to also have a hybrid strategy. People can deploy in physical data centers, some of their databases, and have some of their databases in the cloud, maybe for different purposes, maybe for the same purpose. That's pretty wild. They could have half their applications running in the cloud and pass connecting back to databases in the data center. Bosch even has bare metal CPIs, a cloud provider interface, allowing you to deploy these things on bare metal as well as on VMs. Highly flexible, highly, as I like to say, enterprise ready mm -hmm. stuff. It's got a great orange flavor, too. Yeah. yeah. Really great. You, um, even, you even can use it to deploy a Cloud Foundry platform itself. It so, was actually written itself to deploy Cloud Foundry, mm -hmm. which is basically a complex set of microservices, about 21 or so, that are all interconnected on multiple different VMs and stuff like that. So it was built to deploy that complex system itself. Yeah. It's also the main tool we are using for GE predicts uh, all different kind of deployments. Yes, that's yeah. true. So the GE predicts platform mm -hmm. that was being demoed, all of the uh, Cloud Foundry based and services like databases, RAM, mm -hmm. PostgreSQL, et etc. Yeah. They are all deployed using Bosch to multiple data centers. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, good times. Yeah. 
Oh, did I? Oh, yes. Okay. So that, well, that's great. Now we know how we're going to deploy it and scale it and what, what kind of tool there, how we're going to manage this uh, running yeast. Well, there's a, there's a, there's a further story to this. Um, you want your account for your life cycle of your software, not just the initial deploy, but the upgrade path. Bosch has built in the concept of versions and how to deploy them and stuff like that. But you don't want to stop there. Um, so there's a lot of stuff about CICD and uh, continuous deployment and those kinds of things. So we wanted to make sure that our deployments and our upgrades were automated, no new intervention, except for defining configuration up front. We wanted to make sure that they're audited. And come on, GD and Intel, these are what we building these things for. So therefore, we need full audit trails of all the changes to the infrastructure as you move forward. And we wanted to basically have a, the ability to use a workflow in order to do two things, which I'll get to later. But basically, we wanted to be able to have workflow. If this, then that. This passes, proceeds in this state. We get here and not deploy to production without somebody manually clicking the buttons or somebody watching it react. Those yeah. kinds of things. Yeah, well, what tool we use for this? So for this tool, we use Concourse. This is an off, another offshoot of the Cloud Foundry effort. Somebody from Cloud Foundry uh, wrote this as an open source project. Um, so it, this is not simply a Jenkins competitor. Jenkins is pretty janky. You know how the system works internally. All your data and stuff is put into web UI. None of that. Concourse is a far superior system for a few reasons. First of all, none of your entry and stuff is through the web UI. You basically describe everything in the YAML manifests. You feed the YAML manifests into the system, and then it makes it so. It does this. You can use Docker containers in them. You have full workflow ability. Jenkins is, an, is a, to, to construct workflows with Jenkins is kind of fighting an uphill battle. To construct workflows uh, in this thing, you basically just describe your workflow. You have these things like jobs and uh, resources and, and these different things. I'm not going to go into detail, but basically you can construct your uh, workflow as you want. Yeah. Uh, so next, uh, uh, the Concourse pipeline is my favorite. I will give you some uh, high-level things like how we use Concourse uh, in GE deployment. So basically, we have two type of pipelines. One is the product development. The other is automated lifecycle management. So for, for, produ for product uh, development, let's say many people work on one project. Then you make some change, you want to test that change is working. And if you have a pipeline set up, you make some change, automatically trigger the pipeline, will run it, do the unit test, integration test, um, pass the test, then generate a release for you. So basically, it automates the, the flow uh, when you make the product development. So that's for uh, the release itself. Then after, let's say we already cut our release, we want to deploy this thing to different environment. Then they have another pipeline uh, called automated lifecycle management pipeline. So basically, um, uh, before you push anything to production, you, you may uh, deploy it in sandbox do some tests, then go to production, right? So in this pipeline, uh, they are going to test your deployment. If it's working, uh, the functionality, and uh, if you have a different version of release, how to upgrade. Uh, if you want to push from sandbox to prod, then how you're going to do it. Um, when you once you set up pipeline, it will be very easy. If you see, oh, it goes through the test, it goes through the sandbox test, then you, you just uh, manually click a button, then it will push to a uh, production uh, environment. Uh, we made the, this step manually because we want to double check if everything is well before we really go to production. So that's the basically two, uh, two pipelines they use to help uh, yeah, develop this. So, again, the two pipelines. The first one that we created is for the uh, Postgres platform, uh, the server, server platform itself. Mm -hmm. of that and the second one is the, the standard idea of like, your development environment, your QA environment, your staging environment, or pre-prod, and then working through those things in an automated fashion 
to uh, make sure that things get vetted, automated, and, and people can then just review the uh, results of them and then tweak things to fix them. Yeah, so given their requirement, like uh, we need to provide this Postgres SQL service for their Predix platform for CF, uh, then we not only build uh, the service itself, we also work around, uh, let's say, how we make the workflow to upgrade this service, deploy this service more easily. So that's what you see uh, for those Bosch or pipeline stuff. So we, we work around this for several months. Then a few months later, <laughs> yeah, uh, so uh, time flies. <laughs> Then um, we have, after this uh, a few months, we have our first version in production. <laughs> now comes the time we have real users. Wow. That's a Chinese version to express exciting, you know. But also it's a time to... Yeah, uh, uh, well, it gets kind of crazy, actually. Uh, <laughs> essentially, we, while we had, like, hell of a lot of databases, or users. Users were the application developers. A lot more than we had even anticipated. Yeah. That was fascinating. And it happened pretty quickly. Once they turned it on, it was like, oh, we got some databases, yay. And then the next thing is like, just the number kept on ballooning that quickly. It was yeah. scary, uh, but at the same time. Yeah. Oh, oh yeah. So at the same time, we found like since we have this real user storage, the requirement is changing too. So we got the user feedback like this. So BDR has many re restrictions. Actually, uh, users are not okay with that. So they are thinking, we just need Postgres SQL, no BDR. And at the same time, they require us to add more extensions. Uh, then about like why these BDR restrictions, they are not okay. Uh, we will go through with us like what BDR uh, has those operational issues. So mm -hmm. the first one, and I know there's other ways going about this besides just dump or dump all. But the PG dump and dump all, they don't quite work with BDR very well yet. Or they work, but restore does not. Yeah. For some specific reasons. Yeah. I guess this part we started to go into the, the content that the DBA may care more. Like uh, earlier we do the uh, deployment, uh, like a concourse, DBA may not care about it. Oh, what happened? Uh, but uh, start from here, probably we have more database stuff. So uh, one of the operational issues that we did have was we had frequent failures when trying to add or remove from the cluster, so if we were trying to add a new node or a new cluster or anything else like that. BDR in the back end, the code, it was still young, so it got into, uh, it got itself into these little agency states. And there didn't seem to be, at the time, this may have changed, there did not seem to be many ways where you could add a DBA or something and go in and actually edit the BDR table. Well, they were completely locked out of the agency. That wasn't very helpful. Yeah. Each database uh, connection in BDR requires another connection because it's logical replication, right? So if you have three, two nodes in your cluster, that's one extra connection per database just between those nodes, not kind of user connection. If you have three nodes, which you should, then every database on each node connects to two other nodes to stream the logical log. Uh, uh, so, you know, 100 databases running on there is 200 connections already before any users have connected. Plus, you have to account for admin connections and stuff like that. You know, your number, your number of connections really starts to alter how you're looking at the universe. Uh, global sequences, uh, they're only sequential on a per node basis. So basically, it goes and it allocates chunks. You get this chunk, you get that chunk. And if you run out of that chunk, well, you gotta wait for it to basically agree on the next chunk. And it may not agree on the next chunk. Uh, Restores, this is the issue we had with restores. Restores, it can't set the next cell during restores. So we ended up having to manually try to modify our dumps in order to be able to restore databases onto this thing. 
that guy really needs it, let's just say that. And uh, it ended up with some great late night entertainment. Um, <laughs> entertaining for who I don't know, but also uh, only so many sequence values are allowed for time periods, which is that chunk uh, issue I was referring to. Um, VR itself, what did we learn from that? It's a brilliant, amazing, wonderful idea. It's a very young project. You can be successful with VR if you are in control of your application code so that you can account for DDL locks, you can account for these other things. And unlisted on this slide, if you hire second quadrant to be on your staff, you will be successful with DDL. <laughs> that didn't happen. So yeah. That brings us to, let's step back, regroup. And uh, okay, customer. What's going on here? Well, here, here's what we found, here's what we learned. You know, we did a best effort using DDR from our initial requirements, which were as HA as possible. We were trying for that. Well, it turns out that's not what the users actually needed or wanted. So, to step back, we're going to take a little step backwards to go forward. We uh, ended up agreeing that we would go with solo service clusters. You know, it was just a single master to start. What does this address? Well, this address would be just PostgreSQL. That's what we were expecting, damn it. Why isn't this just Postgres? Why am I getting these weird errors? It's because it's not accessible. It also addresses the operational issues. And uh, also, we were going to add support for more extensions, which is, that's real straightforward. So, of course, they said make it so. As the, you know, but they don't, they don't turns watch out this that, movie. What's that? Maybe they don't watch this movie. <laughs> They're not very nerdy. <laughs> Turns out we are extremely good at adjusting course and addressing issues that arise. So we, what we did, we went, we made it so. Yeah. We uh, adjusted the course. So you, you may be curious, so where we are today uh, for this project? So today, um, the GE Predix production platform, we have, when I checked a few weeks back, or a month ago, it was over, so on the slides at the keynote, he says 3,000 databases. When I checked the last, it was 5,000 databases. A little birdie this morning told me that we're up to around 13,000 databases in across multiple data centers. There's about four. Uh, four, two, four. There's, there's about four data centers. Um, about two to three of them are loaded up and, and active. The other two are under construction. Right. Mm, yeah. Uh, next, also uh, about the architecture we talked about earlier. Oh, we see uh, we have a BDR cluster here. Now after their requirement say only PostgreSQL, so we only have one, uh, one node cluster. Yeah, so the, um, on the step back, we uh, basically only had to go down to one node for each of our things for a while. And basically we got some advice and some, some discussions with uh, OpenSDG. They really know their shit. Um, sorry, I wasn't supposed to swear, was I? Yeah, Wait, no. Mean? All right, um, <laughs> they really know their stuff, and uh, basically they kind of helped us uh, in figuring out where our direction was going next. So uh, we ended up basically going towards this yeah. paradigm. The good thing is, even when we change the structure and uh, what's inside, the tool we used earlier for deployment and auto automatic uh, uh, deployment release, all those things make it very easy. So you, you can do this change very quickly without many manually like a change for each yes. environment. You, you just, again, you, you click a button, all your change pushed to different data center, different environment. Nobody yeah. is going in and, and manually SSHing on the boxes and doing stuff. Yeah. All you have to do is edit the YAML file and change the number from, let's say you've got three service clusters you're handling, three database stations, you, you know, you can't go up to a thousand databases, you're kind of setting a hundred database limit per uh, service cluster, then you literally just go in there and you increase the number of instances from three for your cluster to 10 and say, Bosch deploys, and it goes and it spins up the other seven VMs. And when they come online, they register with the master cluster and then they pre-provision the databases and then they tell the master cluster about the databases that are available. Mm. And then from there, you have this extra capacity. That's all it took. Same yeah. story for scaling up. You need more disk, more CPU, more RAM. Um, and then you just say, 
watch play and go to the platform and you don't design automatically does it so now scale up, scale out. There's more to that story as well. You had a question? So what is the virtualization So uh, for this platform, um, it's uh, we have stuff running on EC2, where with all of our original deployments were, and we also have stuff running in the data center on I think vSphere. Vsphere, yeah. We've run this on other things, but for this effort, we're using those. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, so uh, that, that's what we got, but uh, we're still working on the following things. Uh, the first is, since we changed to BDR to a uh, single solo, oh, that's repeated, uh, solo PostgreSQL node, uh, we are going to work on the streaming re replication. So the step uh, back is basically here we've got this modified Then take a step forward. Then we'll take a step mm. forward after screening reservations, and we're going to keep going yeah. from there to add more types. Yeah. Um, yeah. Oh, we have more time. Yeah, that's fine. Mm. So currently, uh, also, we're working on automated admin administration API for intercluster database migration. So that holds, like, uh, there's also the problem where you have this one user who's storing very large binary block in the damn database. True story. And you have no idea why. They're not willing to stop. You gotta deal with them. So your options are migrate them off to another else off to another cluster. Or migrate them to another cluster. Now depending on how big the database has grown, it's much easier to migrate everybody across. Problem with this is manually. Well, you're going in there, you're doing a dump, putting them over here, and then file over, or restore, maybe you're uh, using Netcat in between to make it really quick and easy, or whatever you happen to be doing. You can kind of automate this as well, some shell scripting and stuff like that. But we said, that's all great, but the way we approach the world, we try to automate everything, and we do, very successfully. So what we're building is you hit an admin API endpoint that says migrate this database from this cluster to this cluster. This is also why OpenSVG had, us, uh, had that uh, PG, uh, the load balancing layer, so that all we have to do is once we that migration is complete, we just change where it's connecting to over to the new cluster, or the new node in the back end. So that enables us to have this flexibility. So that was to help enable the sort. So this helps uh, the, the address the balancing of load or consumption, and also the backup and restore story. It basically it doesn't matter where we restore the database to, the connections we need. Uh, change uh, up at the entry point. So, yeah, so uh, just uh, doing some uh, API uh, endpoint requests to the uh, admin API and the database to get migrated in an automated fashion in the back end. This is, this is a good story. This is what we're working on. Yeah, uh, except this type of migration, we, we also need to uh, migrate all the BDR database to the solo cluster. Because uh, since we spin up the BDR one, uh, we already u we already have a user in there. Now we are changing to a uh, solo PostgreSQL, so we also are working on migrate all those BDR database uh, into the solo cluster. Mm. So that that's what we are currently working on. Uh, uh, would you like to share like what up next we are going to do? Uh, uh, up next immediately after that, well, obviously mm -hmm. the step forward is adding screening replication based clusters. So we'll. Everything we had as solo before will be migrated to the streaming replication so we can enable failover stories and stuff like that. And uh, we're going to use that as admin API we built to do that migration. So that'll be nice. Yeah. And then after that? After that, well, we'll give you a demo. Should we wait for the huh? end to do the demo? Or? Uh, yeah, we can do that. Uh, we'll, at the end, we'll sh quickly show you the, the demo, okay. how to use because it. Because we might run out of time to do the demo at the end. Yeah. Announcement, yay! Okay, so GE has graciously flipped the open source bit in GitHub Utility go to the other way. Settings as you say, make public, kind of cool. <laughs> um, so github.com, critics, RDPG, Bosch release, it's there. If you're familiar with Bosch, you'll be able to take this and run with it, it's easy. If you're not familiar with Bosch, read through the, try it out, ask us questions. We're happy to have everybody try to play with it. And if everybody tries to play with it, that'd be great. Um, 
Okay. Yeah, so uh, I think you are going to talk about the open source software. Okay. So what does this mean for the future? Mm. Well, the future is kind of exciting and out of wow. So <laughs> we're going to move the, uh, right now with the, uh, there's like state store about the service clusters and management cluster is in sync. We're going to make all the state stored on the management cluster. We're going to make this uh, plugin based architecture for the service clusters and we're going to use API contracts because that opens up some very interesting things. Yeah, and next one actually is more exciting. That opens up adding more service cluster types. We could already add dedicated, which we haven't done yet. Trivial. Which means we set the number of instances allowed on these things to one. Uh, but we can add, once that contract is there, we'll be able to add Greenplum, Citus, other services. Maybe we want to add Reddit. Maybe we want to add Elk. Search log slash Kibana. Maybe we want to add time series databases. Who knows? The platform allows for it. Yes. Obviously, my interest is just Postgres, but hey, you know. <laughs> um, the other thing we want to build out is a customer self service dashboard. Well, it would be nice that as, as an application user of these databases, I can actually go on there and say, back my database up now. Now give, give me a URL where I can download it. Um, or other types of tasks. The administration, while I like APIs, and not everybody likes, so some people like the point click, which only want to do a UI for that. And also, uh, identity theft is a big issue in server these days. So uh, we're looking at also time some vault extraction of secrets uh, into that. Yeah. So since it's open source, like uh, there are more effort can be added that the, the wonderful things will happen in the future. But how we, we may wondering uh, how we uh, get involved in this project? Uh -huh. Well, I would love for everybody, which you guys are awesome, you guys are Thank you. Um, shape is the roadmap. Try it out, ask questions, have discussions with us, give us feedback, uh, brainstorm with us, uh, send pull requests. Or, you could actually uh, <laughs> uh, sponsor the project by hiring us to add what you need to it. Um, all the stuff I've described is possibility. What we focus on next is going to be what we or a client needs next. Um, so if you have something you want our focus on, we are very much open to this. Yeah. So maybe I'll, I will give the demo then? Sure. Uh, yeah. um, so she's going to give a quick demo. Uh, let me see. Yeah. Oh. Terminal. Yeah. Oh, Terminal. Yeah. So uh, let me see if I'm connected. All right. So this is one instance uh, we already created for for the user. I, I already uh, connected to this database. Uh, what I mainly want to show you is uh, how it can do backup and restore. So inside here. Wait, okay. Uh, you can see we have a database called uh, PGC 2016. Mm, let me, let us see what's inside this table. Okay, wait. Uh, oh, oh, oh. <laughs> okay, I got it. So I can, you want this? Yeah, I already did. So I needed a terminal. It's hard to, okay. So I select, basically I just insert the information of two of us. And uh, yeah, uh, I said, uh, when I introduced myself to people, I said, hey, I'm XJ. Then people later, hey, are you XY or XYJ? <laughs> no, I'm XJ. Yeah, and uh, our company, like, oh, this is our, one of the, oh, what's that called? I don't know, you call it a slogan or a model? Oh, slogan, yeah. Basically, if you, you know, when, we're, when you're working with us, it's not, you're not just getting the skills and talents of a single per, uh, pair of people that you're working with. We uh, talk internally a lot and share all our experiences internally. So you basically get all 30 people or so. Yeah, so I try to be funny and put something I see here to literally people think I'm XY also. So now uh, let's, uh, okay, okay, go here. So this is the, oh, sorry, I need to go here. So this is the command we use to back up the database. So I, I run this, then we will back up the, uh, the database uh, so we, we are using. this against the administration API. Yeah. Database. Now we are going to do something terrible here. Am I here? 
Then I'm going to drop the table. P A B L E is hard to see because it's not on my screen. P G C. P G C two thousand sixteen. Oh, oh oh. Okay. Now, if you see, we don't have that table here anymore. Now we go back to restore our database. Let me do this one. Which again?